Welcome to another episode of Humans with a Purpose. Today, my guest is very special. She will draw you in with her energy. She is a creative soul. She is a spiritual soul. She is an artist. She's a teacher. She's a singer. Her mission in life is to revive the cultural arts, especially the Punjabi culture. Bina G, thank you so much for joining my show all the way from Lahore, Pakistan. And here you are sitting in Lahore, and here I am sitting in California, and I'm so happy to connect with you and to have this conversation today. So Bina Ji, I came across you, and it happened by chance. I was watching YouTube videos, and I came across this school called the Harsuk School. Can you explain what Harsuk is, and can you tell us about your school? You know, Alia, we shifted to this uh, Hasuk community. Uh, it is a slightly out of Lahore, but it is in the farm lands. And we had, both my husband and myself, had land over here uh, for many years. So I, it, that nothing happens by coincidence. I think it is the plan of the creator that I went, went to one house and I met with a lady uh, who had just retired from a school playing play group or uh, a nursery for 34 years. I said, oh, and she was, uh, she was uh, saying, lamenting that she still wanted to teach, but the schools would not, they had retired her, you see, because her age was 65 now. I said, why don't you come to Hasuk? I need a teacher. Mm-hmm. So she came over and I gave her the library and she brought along her friend and they set up a school. So it had happened that uh, the five children grew from five to 35 within a short time. So they were having 35 kids coming from the surrounding areas of all ages, you know, uh, of different classes, and they were working with these children. And then my own daughters, they kept a summer camp and we had a summer camp in the summer uh, months. And again, we had some more people from outside coming in. So slowly, Hasuk, a school was growing. And then uh, from 35, it went up to 65, and so on and so forth. As people kept hearing about the school, they brought the children in, and they brought all of the children together, like five brothers and sisters, three brothers and sisters. So the school was quickly growing. And then we had a, a person come in who was, had a little bit of uh, experience of running the school in another city, and uh, he uh, agreed to stay on and he became the, the principal of the school. So slowly we saw that the, organically the school was, was coming up and uh, we had people coming in to volunteer and we had a principal now and we had ourselves as well, the family uh, contributing to the teaching. These are children from the surrounding areas. These are probably farmers' children's. Yes, yes. And, and these, are, uh, these are, they come from families who don't have the means to pay for an education. Uh, they had never seen a school, actually. Their families hadn't ever seen a school. Their children from uh, these uh, farmers, uh, small uh, storekeepers, or whatever, you know, they, they live in the locality, in the villages around. And uh, then my daughter, uh, daughters, both of them, uh, their eldest uh, two sons are now going on 15. And uh, they drew out their children from the public schools, you know, in the city and brought them to the school. So my grandchildren also go to the school hmm. and uh, along with the rest of the village kids. And they love it. They like, uh, you know, uh, sitting around and playing with the kids and they have a, a good time. Yeah. Bina, Bina G, what what drew me to you is mm. you are someone that strikes me who lives a life of purpose in everything uh, that you do. So how do you define purpose? What is your definition of purpose? You know, uh, I will not say that everyone who is born realizes their purpose. That is the most difficult thing. To realize one's purpose is like saying enlightenment. Mm. It is the enlightenment of the sages 
who knew what the purpose was, or of the psychic uh, uh, people who channel from the other beyond the curtain, who know what their purpose is. Most of the population of this world lives without purpose because the purpose of this world has been turned into consumerism and materialism. Hmm. So the purpose of every person is now to gather money and to, to fulfill the desires of this world. That is what the common purpose of everyone is. That is why the world is going down because every, whether they're rich or whether they're poor, their purpose is to have a jolly good time and to spend money and to fulfill their desires. And here I'm going to say that if a person is genuinely sensitive to their feelings, and this life itself is the book, is the instruction book, in which every day brings along an event and puts it on your plate. That event which comes onto your plate, you have to unflinchingly look at mm -hmm. and to observe and that event is going to change you because most of the events I'm talking about are not happy happy you know glorious days it is pain and suffering now pain and suffering on your plate is the thing which is going to change you after going through pain and suffering if you are sensitive and open to that event and open to self-awareness of who you are and why has this event come in front of your eyes, why is it there? You question and questioning has to happen. Without questioning, you cannot go forward. So when you question and you say, why have I faced such a dreadful thing? And then you if you start looking within yourself and you look at your mental construct and your emotional construct, you will see that everything is, is, is uh, constructed. It is like, uh, how should I say? It is a construct of the ego mind. So eventually you realize that everything is an illusion. It is an illusion of the mind because your mind is working in a certain way. Now, if you Take the mind not for yourself. It is not you. Your mental thoughts are not you. They are stuck in your mind because you were conditioned as a child to think that these are the thoughts you should be having and these are the thoughts you should not be having. So when you start realizing, oh, wow, this is my mind. And you start looking at your mind. This is called self-awareness. Mm your mind you look at each thought in your mind and you realize that sometimes that thought makes you cry sometimes it makes you laugh so therefore it is an illusion it is not you it is the thought which is making you one way or the other so then you start questioning so then who am i then who am i if i'm not these thoughts if i'm not this emotion then who am i if i'm not this brain if I'm not this ego mind, if I'm not the ego, then who am I? And when you question this one very fundamental question of who am I, you will start unloading your mind. You will start saying, not this, not this, not this, not this. And when you come through the process of elimination, you will come to the truth. Hmm. But you have to be very, very like a surgeon with a scalpel. You will have to cut away all the dross from the mind. You will have to cut away all nonsense from the mind, all conditioning from the mind. You know, at one time, I, it came up, it, as I was growing up, there was a lot of uh, hoo-ha about, oh, that person is so pious, so virtuous, he has built a hospital for the people. Oh, that person is so good. And people used to praise uh, a certain person who was doing philanthropic work. Yes. And uh, one day I, I, I was sitting, I said, it just came to my mind. It just came. It, without, I, you know, many things used to come from out of somewhere because uh, I, I was never a mind person <laughs> in a way. I would never follow my mind. I would always follow my heart. So I would do things impulsively. I would just go and do something and I might regret it later, but 
it, what my heart told me, I said, oh, okay, you know, this is what I'm going to do. So this my voice comes and it says, I think out of all the philanthropy in this world, if a person realizes the spiritual self, that would be the greatest work. Mm. That would be the greatest work on this world is for a person to realize who they are. And it's not the outward, it's the inward. Because a lot yes. of philanthropy is doing things for other people. Yeah, yes. But what yes. you're saying is, is look inside yourself. Yes, yes. And yes. if you have that self-awareness, if you <clears throat> uncover what's inside yeah. you, mm. that's the biggest service that you can do for the world. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because the first act of giving you have to do with yourself. Mm, the first yes. forgiving, the first forgiving is for yourself. The first acceptance is of yourself. The first love you give is to yourself. And this is written in the path, in the path to the truth. You first of all have to be selfish. Meaning to say you have to look at yourself and you have to heal. You have to heal this self. Once this self is healed and complete, only then can it give. How yes. can it give if yes. it is not complete in itself? Yes, yes. Hmm? So, so Bina G, you mentioned that it's the grief, it's the suffering that leads you huh. to your purpose. What was... How did you discover your own purpose? You mentioned that you follow your heart. What grief or what, I was, what, what was on your plate that led you to go inwards? Uh, yes. I fell in love with my husband. Right? That was a grief. It gave me a lot of grief for many years. <laughs> 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 because what happens is that you start expecting when you give love, when you love someone, you expect them to love you equally like you are loving them, right? Yes. So that was the first grief, the grief of expectations. Then there was the grief of self-pity, right? That I, oh, oh I do this, no, 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 this. Oh, for example, my father-in-law, who was my best friend, he died and I cried for one week. I was crying and crying and uh, a voice comes and says, huh, you say that uh, people who die, the soul goes back to, to love and to liberation. Why are you crying? You're not crying for him. You're crying for yourself. This voice of self-pity spoke. I said, oh my God. I said, ah, this is self-pity. And I've been crying in self-pity for self. I used to feel things very strongly. That was the thing. Now, because of my heart, as a heart person, I was very sensitive. This thing, ah, so this is self-pity. And I stopped crying immediately. And I found the, the how you say, the weakness in being self-pitying. Immediately the realization came, this self-pity is making you so grief struck. It is making you so pained. This is self-pity. You don't need to self-pity. So immediately after that day, I became aware of self-pity. So these things used to come to me very intensely. Self-pity or grief or pain or hurt or not expectations being realized, hurt by that, hurt by... So everything used to hurt, but I luckily, I used to feel it, right? Even though people used to say, uh, Bina doesn't feel any emotion, but I used to keep it all inside. I didn't show it outside. <laughs> but I used to feel very strong. This was a blessing in disguise. My number two daughter, uh, she was born with a cleft palate. And uh, I did not know what a cleft palate was. I was ignorant about this uh, medical situation. And I was still giving her my breast milk. Now, a cleft palate baby cannot suck on, a, uh, on the mother's breast because it has a hole in the upper palate. So it cannot make the suction. Mm. So I was feeding her and uh, uh, luckily she survived because she was born nine and a half pounds. And uh, she, whatever milk used to drain out of my breast used to enter her mouth and she survived on the, on the little bit of milk she was getting. 
and a little sometimes water I would give her. But otherwise, she was slowly, slowly, slowly uh, wasting away, and uh, she became a bag of bones. By the end of uh, uh, in the in between, she had bronchitis, but I, I refused to give her antibiotics. I gave her homeopathic. She re recovered from that, and then uh, uh, by the nineteenth day, uh, my elder daughter. Uh, she was relapsing into unconsciousness and I did not realize this is unconsciousness uh, that it is just weakness and starvation. So uh, my daughter Zainab uh, who was uh, older to her by one and a half years she had her uh, uh, teething happening and so she was having some bloody stools because it happens when you're having your canines uh, coming out you do have suffer from some uh, you know these problems. So at night I was up with Zainab and Salima sort of woke up and, and whimpered a little bit and I said, Salima uh, petted her, go to sleep in the morning, I will give you a bottle. Now look at that. It was not my mind, it was not my intelligence. I was uh, totally without intellect at that time. I did not know what was happening, but it came out of my mouth, I will give you a bottle. Now, in the, I put Zainab to bed. Salima had lapsed into unconsciousness. In the morning, I made a bottle for Salima, a bottle of milk, and I put it to Salima's mouth, and she just said a couple of times, and she lapsed back into unconsciousness. And I looked at the bottle, and there was hardly a drop of milk which had left the bottle. And suddenly, suddenly, like out of the heavens, it came to my mind, my God, she is not drinking milk. Mm. She, it came, it came, it was like a, uh, it was like a light which was thrown into my head that she is not drinking milk. And then it was like, ah, and then on the same day, now this is heaven working now, on the same day, my sister-in-law came back from abroad and she was a social worker. And she, when she met Salima and myself, she said, you know, a cleft palate baby cannot feed on the breast. It has to be given a special nipple on the bottom. So we started feeding her. She took her away and she kept spoon feeding her. So with the spoons, she was giving her milk slowly, slowly. Now this baby has been starving for 20 days. So wow. slowly, slowly, she was being given this drop by drop of milk. And I then invented a bottle for her, a nipple with the three big holes that I would uh, uh, topple the, uh, you know, put it upside down the bottle, then put it back so the air would enter and a gulp of milk would go into her mouth. So I made that bottle and she survived. My daughter survived. But it left me totally shattered. It left me totally shattered as a mother. I could not imagine my child dying of starvation. Where I, whereas I had so much milk in my breasts. I had money. It was not that I was a poor lady somewhere who did not have, you know, the means. I had relatives and friends. None of them came to my help. They did not know what was happening. I had everything, everything you could say, a well-to-do family, relations, everything you could say, doctor friends. The whole world was there on my, you know, I could have approached. But because, and I said, you do not know anything. So I realized I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. All my education is fruitless, has not helped me in this situation. All my education, all my relatives and friends haven't helped me. So I have no gumand, meaning to say there's no pride in having lots of friends and relatives. I have, a, the money has not come in. So it, there's no pride in having a little bit of money anyway. It's not going to help you. So I said, none of these things helped. None of these things helped in saving my baby's life. And it was Allah. It was Allah himself who has saved my baby. And from that day, I realized that we are nothing. We are incapable of doing anything. And it stuck, it has become, it was so solid because he, Allah himself told me that all your intelligence, I was a very intelligent person, 
I used to come first in my classes. I was, uh, I, there was lack of nothing in my life. And suddenly you realize that you're nothing. And for five years I cried. Alia, for five years I was crying. Every time someone would ask me about Salima, I would cry. And I would, because that, that thinking, it came in front of me. As a mother, how could I have born if my baby had died of starvation? I wouldn't have survived. Right. How could I have taken this pain? And it was only Allah who helped me. It was only Allah. So after that, I realized, you are nothing. This world is nothing. Nobody is nothing. Nothing is nothing. This is nothing. Only with the grace of Allah can you survive and can you do anything. So after that, my only purpose was to find myself and to find my Allah. That was the purpose. And, and people say, oh, but you built a school. I said, I didn't build it. I didn't build a school. I didn't build this hasuk. This was his will. This was his plan. He used me as an instrument. I was just an instrument through which, through which, out of which mouth he was saying, okay, let us build this house. Mm. Out of this brain, he said, he gave this idea. Okay, let's build hasuk. Uh, out of this, something came. He, he, he gave me this, uh, he, he gave people, he gave ideas coming to, to this head. He put ideas here. It was not this brain. It is this, your mind is nothing. It can't plan anything. How can it help anyone? It itself is dependent on this one energy. How can it help? There's only one helper and there's only one planner. And if we do not, uh, if we still think that we are the planners and we are the thinkers and we are the philanthropists and we are the uh, artists, we are nothing. We are nothing. He gave me a lot of gifts. I loved, I wanted to sing ever since I was a child. I used to have a fight with him. I said, Allah, you created me into, a, you made me into a woman, into a girl. Actually, you should have made me into a man, into a boy, because my voice is so heavy. <laughs> 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 As a little child, I, I think I was uh, uh, eight or nine, uh, uh, maybe six or seven, or maybe younger than that. And I would have a fight with him. I said, mm, <laughs> you have given such, such a heavy voice. And this belongs to a boy, not to a girl. I said, you have made me into a girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it was in, a, in the child's innocence, you know, the child always speaks. And they speak to their, uh, the one, the creator. Because it recently come from that, that dimension, which is it's beyond this curtain. Uh, they've come from that dimension of love and, yes. and uh, holiness. They're yes. holy. Children are yes. holy. They come and they, they are without any worldly concepts. They come and because they're holy, they can talk to their God just like that. And they, you know, so we, what I feel now is that we need to give our children back their holiness. We need mm. to give them back their trust in their themselves, the holiness which lives within because Allah and, is and how do you And how do you do that, Binaji? How do you give back our children and and how do you give back adults their holiness how do you do that you just you just need the adults need to feel that they are being loved you see why all this pain and grief because the adults think they are not being loved that there is something wrong with them that they will not be loved uh, and immediately say oh you will go to hell oh you and they're striving their whole lives to go to heaven. For heaven's sake, they're already in heaven. They just need to realize that. They just do need to realize. Like that heaven, heaven soul, starts from here. Heaven starts from where yes, we are today. Yes, yes. That this is heaven. They just have to recognize themselves. They have to recognize their connection with that one, which is within themselves and with within every particle after quantum theory, we have learned that, that that one is in every particle. So the, the one is, is that energy in which we are blowing. We are a part of that one energy, right? We are a part of that one whole energy and it is infused within 
and it is everywhere. Mm. So if the person is, if this, uh, how should I say, dogmatic religions and dogmatic ideologies uh, do not talk about hell and you are wrong and you are right and this is, you are bad and you are good. If we have all of this out of the system, then people will discover themselves and will discover that whatever they are, they have to accept themselves. They are who they are because that one, they are, they are a part of that one energy and they're not separate from that energy. They, because they are part of the energy, they have to discover that energy within themselves. It is already there, but the ego mind shutters it off. The ego mind uh, makes a barrier, a curtain between your true self. From It prevents you from observing and finding out who you are. That is the ego. And what does the ego say? The ego is so afraid to die, let me tell you. The moment mm -hmm. your ego, your mind starts thinking on these lines, you will get a hundred thousand doubts coming into the mind from the ego. The ego will start doubting. Huh? What is she saying? Huh? How can you be in heaven? Huh? How can you be good? Huh? How are you loved? Now I'm telling you, you are being loved. You are being loved that by that one energy which is within yourself. So the fountainhead of love is in you. You don't have to love anyone to receive love. You have to love yourself to receive it's, love. It's going back to what you said, which is self-love, self-care. Yes. Yes. Getting yes. Is, is going in here. And then once you uh, love yourself, then you are capable of loving others. Of loving others. Only when you can love and accept yourself can you accept and love the other. Yes. Not before that. Everything other is superficial. All philanthropy is superficial. Philanthropy is to make you feel good, is to make yourself feel good. It's to, to take care of your ego. Yes. Yes. Veena G, mm. what, ab what about people who help you in finding your purpose? Has there been anyone in your life who's helped you or you know, everyone these days is looking for like a spiritual guide, someone to like, I know. you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, yes. Aliyah, I tell you, after uh, many, uh, I reached a point of uh, grief and pain in which my expectations were not being fulfilled. And the cry came out of my heart and uh, that now I want to feel that love, which cannot give me pain any longer a love which is other than pain, right? As soon as that aspiration came out of my heart, I was shown people who were talking like this of your soul, of your consciousness. And I, my, my, so you see, my purpose was not from the mind. It was from the heart. The heart needed to, to find that joy that what this says a happy life which i wasn't even though i had everything but the feeling of you know being the, there's something totally, still missing there's something yeah, missing of course, yes yes, yes. Uh, missing yeah. yes that uh, there's something missing so i was shown people and i i my heart said i want to meet people mm. and then i was shown people who talked about the spirit, who talked about the soul, who talked about self-awareness, who talked about all these things. And I cried and cried when I met the first person, I cried and it was my soul crying. It was the inner was the heart which was crying that I had found, I had found something which is talking to my heart, which is telling me what I really needed to find, right? Then after that person, I asked, again, I prayed to God. I said, Allah, I have, uh, my homeopathic doctor has uh, shifted to Australia. So I, in Lahore, I don't have any homeopathic doctor. And now I need a homeopathic doctor because I always did homeopathy. I never went to allopath. And I need a homeopathic doctor. This time I need a doctor who's also talking about spirit. 
So lo ji, I came back to Pakistan. I was in UK. I came back and uh, after a week, uh, Jawad comes and says, oh, you see my, my uh, junior in, uh, in my school, he uh, was an architect, but now he's a, he's a doctor, homeopath doctor, and uh, I have taken an appointment for you. So I go and I meet uh, uh, Dr. Habib Rahman, Dada Bhai. Mm -hmm. And he is of the Sabwari Silsla. He's of the Chishti Avasya Silsla. Mm -hmm. The Sufi Silsla. Yes. And uh, I keep meeting. I meet him. I ask him questions. He answers. I love the answers. I said, my God, I tell him, I want to sit at your feet. I want to be with you. And I want to sit at your feet. And I want to uh, take the blessing and the grace mm -hmm. which I see coming out of you. Yes. And he says, uh, uh, he smiles and he says, uh, it's all right. You don't have to sit on my feet. We are friends. We are friends. You can come anytime you like, right? So I start going to him. I, all my, whatever I had in my mind, the ego, I used to talk to him. I said, mm. uh, frustration, this, this thing, that thing. Blah, blah. And he would just listen very quietly and he would say, stop using your mind too much you know? so every time i would i would be very relieved to have been able to talk and to share my inner feelings with someone because you need to have someone to listen to your inner feelings yes. your deepest feelings and so uh, i spent 20 uh, let me see yeah 20 odd years with him I was, uh, we were going, we were sitting together, we were talking, uh, we were discussing and slowly what happens is that he didn't used to, he didn't talk. He just, his presence was enough. So I, whenever I used to be with him, there was a connection which Carl Jung also says. Carl Jung says that between the doctor and the patient, an automatic transference happens right. in which his knowledge his knowledge, his, ha ha his beingness is transferred into the patient. Mm. So with the murshid and the murid, the guru and the disciple, it happens the same way. The guru, because he is, has arrived at that point of enlightenment, he transfers the, the, the disciple who is wanting to get that same knowledge which will fulfill the disciple yes. happens automatically without even touching, without even speaking. Yes. It's transferred. And that happens when both of the hands come together in a, in a clap, that both are ready, one to give and the other to receive. Yes. That is when that happens. Yes. And, it, and so that's I, also through divine power, isn't that? Yes, yes, yes. You can't you see, go out seeking. You can't seek out your, I was talking to somebody and he uh, said, you can't go out and seek a teacher. It's not a spiritual market. No, 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 it's no, no. It's God placing this person yes. in front of you yes. and, he, and uh, that teacher finds you versus you finding uh, him. Uh -huh. And, and uh, then uh, it was so, uh, such a blessing. Uh, because uh, then you realize that everything is happening because your inner consciousness was ready to find a teacher. And it placed you in front of a teacher, right? And then the work goes on. And this is called the work. This is what our purpose is, to work on ourselves, to work on finding the truth, to work on finding the reality, and then to vibrate it and to spread it around to the rest of the world that is the real purpose of every person who has acquired the real agnostic how do you say the real knowledge of truth that this is the truth so then the purpose itself is given by the that one energy which is within as well as out okay now you have got the knowledge now your duty he gives a duty your duty is to sit in this world. You can't leave it because many times I said, I'm fed up of this world. I don't, yes. I don't want to stay here. Yes. And then, and then a Dr. Saab used to say, I call him Dr. Saab. Yes. Says, no, 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 no. This is a beautiful world. This is so beautiful. I used to say, what? Why is this saying so beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and he was like, he could see in me, within me na he knew that she was a very rebellious thing <laughs> so, I, 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 so he said oh, no this is a beautiful bird and i would just keep i would just keep quiet then you know <laughs> so now i i realize that we are given you know a purpose not by our minds but a purpose is given and not by our selves it is given to you and you have to then take on that purpose it is a duty yes. you are duty bound right yes huh. what about for for young people because you look at mm. you know and this is where your work comes in with the harsuk school you're you're mm. in a way helping these children find their divine love right connecting them to their mm -hmm. innocence by giving them this mm -hmm. well-rounded education that's not mm -hmm. just focused on english it's punjabi mm -hmm. it's it's music mm -hmm. it's everything the real education mm -hmm. as you say mm -hmm. but you know you have this small group of kids but what about the rest what about everyone else who's um I know. struggling what 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 mm -hmm. what advice would you give to them especially now with this whole pause in ah. humanity and you know everyone is questioning everything you know uh, i wish i wish all the youngsters all the adults every person on earth would realize that they are fine as just as they are hmm. they don't have to be ambitious and competitive they're all right as they are even if they don't know anything they're fine even if they don't know any skill or hunar they're fine even if the people call them you see what the, it is a society which breaks them up by calling them stupid and uneducated and uh, no 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 one is uneducated this is our our tight brain which says education should be like this or this a degree not this no no one is educated because your whole uh, university is within yourself if they can only start self observing and self awareness all this is the real education of self awareness i don't agree in reading tens of books and tens of degrees and getting a doctorate or whatever that is i will say a bad word but that is what is driving a world to the edge of the precipice it has made them so competitive you see my my mother uh, she had just done her fa the 12th class i would say yes. and she was married and all her life she was left with this uh, sad feeling that she's not educated she she used to tell us two daughters we are two daughters you have to do your phd's you have to do your doctorates you are, i was never educated you have to be educated <laughs> right i know exactly <laughs> i i you know what i know exactly what you mean cuz i come from a similar <laughs> background too yeah my so, hope you you're my hope you're my hope right <laughs> yeah. as you said expectation yeah. the expectation yes, yeah yeah from the children what she couldn't do she wanted her girls to do now looking at her i have never seen a more educated person than my mother i have yet to see another woman who has done doctorates who's one tenth of education that she was and her education was because she would ask questions she would uh, inquire her mind was inquiring this is education an inquiring mind which would ask questions which would find out from within herself the answer mm -hmm. and she was the most gentle soft spoken gentle person she was the most uh, motive you know uh, lifting up other people she would um, was a self taught artist she started taught herself painting she made the most beautiful paintings and then when you asked her uh, should i put an exhibition for ha ha hi hi i haven't even learned painting what do i know about painting i don't know anything this was her uh, response and so looking at her i said my god such a uh, there was no ego over there it was almost like a negative ego you know she didn't know anything 
she was not capable of doing anything even though she was the most beautiful artist and it comes from the family you see when you have humble parents and uncles and you know others uh, who are humble who don't think much of what they're doing but they're just doing it as a duty because they have to do it because they're committed to it they're diligent they're hard working so when you see in a family hard working people who are honest truthful who are humble that gives you the child a good background that gives the child a good environment to grow up in but don't worry alia what i've seen is that allah which is everywhere is himself looking after his people those who get ready those who become ripe he makes ready all these fruit on the tree this world is a tree with all these fruit hanging from it slowly one by one they become ripe and they take on the flavor and the essence and that is what we need for the tree to blossom now the real purpose is we have to save this planet that is the real purpose now for everyone but i feel that all those youngsters out there all the adults and even if they save this bit of a planet every day in their own houses they're saving the planet yes like we say trash and rubbish i tell them we are going to recycle we say recycle things even that is helping the planet yes not cutting down a tree that's helping the planet and not creating pollution that's helping the planet let alone sending okay looking within ourselves is a difficult thing na and to look within you and to <laughs> look at you know because many people say ah but amma i look within myself and i see a lot of darkness uh, i i get afraid i stop i said don't get afraid you have to go through the darkness you should have the courage to go through the darkness to find the light at the end of the tunnel hmm. i was going to ask you to sing a verse because you have a beautiful voice too but i don't want to put you on the spot there's this one of shah hussain uh, who for me that his verse is so apt it is so beautiful we say that he has contained the ocean in this cup so he has written this uh, poetry which goes like raba mere haal da mehram tu raba mere haal da mehram tu अंदर तू है बाहर तू तू अंदर तू है बाहर तू है रोम रोम विच तू रो मेरे हाल दहरम तू थैंक यू थैंक यू सब कुछ मेरा तू मेरे हाल दा मेहरम तू